We're going to get started. Um, as many of you may know, March is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, so we do this program every year. And we are going to get started with our first speaker who's going to talk to us about risk factors and screening guidelines for colorectal cancer. And I would like to welcome Dr. Seth Gross, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Medicine and the Division of Gastroenterology. Let's welcome Dr. Gross. Oh, that's okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Seth Gross. It's a real pleasure to be here this afternoon uh, to talk to you uh, during my favorite month of the year, which is uh, colorectal cancer uh, awareness. Even though it doesn't stop just in March, it sort of just begins. And uh, I spend uh, the majority of my time trying to prevent colon cancer by doing a lot of colonoscopy or encouraging individuals to get other forms of screening because the best test is the test that we complete. I also do a lot of clinical research to actually help physicians that do colonoscopy do a better job to help improve uh, polyp detection, which are the precancerous little growths that could develop in one's colon. And if we remove those, we disrupt the pathway towards colon cancer. So before we get into the risk factors and screening guidelines in terms of when someone should uh, start to think about getting screened for colorectal cancer, there are a lot of myths out there about uh, colonoscopy and colon cancer, and should someone get screened? Are, are there any individuals that are ever exempt from getting screened from uh, uh, colon cancer? I think there is one group, and those are those individuals that unfortunately do not have a colon. So if you don't have a colon, you're officially exempt. But everybody else, believe it or not, is eligible uh, for quite a long time. So the first myth, uh, there is nothing I could do about getting colorectal cancer. True or false? We're not going to use clickers. You could put your clickers uh, to the side. Uh, you, you could get screened, and you could modify risk factors. So there's actually something uh, one could do, and the whole idea of doing this is to do this when you're feeling well. I love doing colonoscopy on people that are feeling well. I never like doing colonoscopy when someone comes to me who's past the age of when screening should start and they have rectal bleeding or abdominal pain or change in their bowel habits. I always get a little worried uh, that I might find something like an early colon cancer. And, uh, and so there are things that we can do. Is colorectal cancer fatal? Oftentimes you come to these types of talks or we lecture doctors about different uh, conditions that are, that are cancerous or malignant and we don't have a good story to tell. We're still trying to figure it out. We're, we're, we're still trying to find treatments and tests to, to, prevent colon, uh, to prevent cancer. And I could say for colorectal cancer, I think we've, we've done a nice job. It's actually a curable disease. It's a preventable disease. Now, of course, there are going to be people out there that have genetic predispositions and develop colon cancer at a very young age, an age that we couldn't predict because they didn't even know that they carried a certain mutation that had them develop colon cancer in their 20s and, and 30s. But for the average risk individual, those, and there's some debate of is it 45 or 50, and I'll touch upon that, but we'll say 50 for right now because that's what most people think about. Uh, it is uh, preventable and curable, and we cure early colon cancer in about 90% of people, and, even th and, and those cancers are those that are just limited to the colon. Now, how about people that have more advanced disease? Sometimes it spreads beyond the colon and goes to a lymph node or even goes to another organ, most commonly the liver, and we still could do a pretty good job with that, partnering with our surgeons and our oncologists and our genetic counselors to, to actually not just help that patient but help their family members to start getting screened at an earlier time. So, so colon cancer is beatable, and we have a lot of patients out there that have uh, been able to beat colon cancer. Screening is only necessary for individuals who have symptoms. So I sort of gave you the answer to that. Um, I want people that have no symptoms. I want people that are healthy. Those are the best kind. Because polyps oftentimes do not have symptoms. And I find a lot of polyps. All my colleagues find a lot of polyps. And even early colon cancer does not have any symptoms. Even yesterday, I saw a patient that uh, happened to get a surveillance colonoscopy. This patient was in her 60s. She had no symptoms, and I found a colon cancer. Uh, she was as surprised as I was. Now, she did fall off the surveillance map, meaning she didn't get followed up, and she didn't come for her next exam, but she didn't have any symptoms. So screening is meant for those not having symptoms. Uh, these are, this is meant for people that are, are doing well. And my favorite conversation to have with folks, and I had one the other day, is uh, I don't want a colonoscopy. 
And I don't, I'm not a salesman. I just, I just give advice, right? Doctors just give advice, and it's up to you if you want to take that advice. It's, it's shared decision making. Uh, and uh, that person ended up walking out getting screening for colon cancer, so that was a, a win. Only people with a family history of colon cancer get it. You know, that, I encounter that a lot, and that is actually completely not true. Most of the colon cancers that I've seen in my career, there's no family history. And uh, overall, most patients uh, around the world that get colon cancer don't have a family history, and 75% of cases have no uh, known family history. So what does family history mean? Family history just means that I will meet patients uh, that maybe should get their screening earlier because they had a loved one get colon cancer at a young age. Or they should uh, never be a 10-year interval colonoscopy. They should always do it every five years. Uh, so that's what that means. Men and women um, are equally affected. So there was a thought that this was only a disease for men. And uh, if you were a female patient, you would never get colon cancer because it's a man's disease. But actually, it does not discriminate. It affects men and women uh, equally. How many people in this room, just show of hands, have had some form of colon cancer screening? I'm talking to the wrong audience. I need to find the people that are not uh, doing this. And believe it or not, there are millions of people that are not getting colon cancer screening, millions. And that's why we're making some headway, but we could certainly be doing a better, a better job. If I have a polyp, I have cancer. That's always another long conversation when I tell people that I found a polyp, and oftentimes polyps can be precancerous, but it is not cancer. Once we remove that polyp, we've disrupted that part of the colon from progressing to colon cancer. And then the other thing that it does, depending on the type of polyp, the number of polyps, the size of the polyp, it will risk stratify that person for the next colonoscopy. People could have colonoscopy every three years, every five years, if they have no polyps uh, every 10 years. Sometimes your doctor may say, I want you to come back in a year or six months, and it could be that the cleanse that day wasn't great and we wanna make sure we didn't miss anything, or maybe the doctor found a very large polyp and they wanna make sure that there's no residual at that area, even though we felt we got it off during that colonoscopy, so we bring someone back. Because there is, even though colonoscopy is the best test for colon cancer, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, and it's not because I offer it, it's because it's a test I could see a polyp and remove it, and there's really no other test that could do it. But like with any test, with any screening test, it's not a perfect test. And so we really try to aim to improve upon that through uh, clinical research. Uh, but the one thing that's important from my side is to uh, make sure that we leave no polyp cell behind because that could grow back and the person could develop a, a cancer. Now, the other thing that comes up is, you know, colonoscopy is scary. Now, I've personally had my colonoscopy. I had mine with no sedation, not because I'm a thrill seeker, but uh, it's completely doable with no sedation. But just to give you a sense. Well, well, well. I thought we'd never get you in here. Can we just hurry up and get this over with? Where's the doctor? The doctor will be with you in a moment. Is he any good? He's the Michael Jordan of the colonoscope. I've seen him put one in from across the room. Well, what kind of drugs are you guys getting? Oh, Dr. Rawls only uses one drug. No. Not that painful. 
Uh, most of the time you're, you're, you're sedated or you could actually safely do this with no sedation. Now this, uh, this video clip has been translated into about 40 different languages. It's all over YouTube. It actually comes from a TV show in Living Color from the mid 90s, when I, before I even knew I was gonna be a gastroenterologist. And I always share this with my, with my colleagues. Uh, the colonoscopy experience here at NYU is a little bit different. We, we don't have all that stuff. We do play music though. Uh, we usually let uh, the person pick what they wanna listen to as they, as they fall asleep. But the point is, is that uh, colonoscopy, which is our best tool to prevent colon cancer, is uh, safe. It's, it's comfortable, it's painless, and it could be done with or without uh, sedation. And so uh, I just wanted to you know, get that myth out of the way. So now we're just gonna switch over to some risk factors for, for colon cancer. So we know that most colon cancers occur after the age of uh, 50. And that's why it's been recommended that patients should st start getting screened uh, for colon cancer at that age. Now, there are some situations where we screen earlier if there's a, a family history of a first degree relative that may have gotten colon cancer at the age of 50, we recommend uh, the other relatives to get screened earlier like their kids uh, at the age of 40, 10 years uh, before. What about diet? Uh, rich in red meat increases your risk. A diet rich in fruits and vegetables decreases your risk. And you could probably apply this to most diseases that uh, we try to do prevention for. If it looks too good, you probably shouldn't overdo it. And if it's something that you don't love, it's probably good for you. What about other things that could raise your risk? Low physical activity, being overweight, smoking, alcohol use that's excessive, and type two diabetes. So these are all risk factors, thankfully, that we could try to prevent. Doing more exercise, weight reduction, not smoking, having no or minimal alcohol, and then if you fix the above, your type two diabetes will get better as well. What are conditions that are out of your control? There are some people out there that have these chronic conditions of the colon called ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease that even if they're managed perfectly well with medication, after someone has these diseases for eight to 10 years, they actually have an increased risk of developing colorectal cancer. And so those are the, the people that you may know that say they go to their doctor for colonoscopy every year because that doctor is looking for precancerous change. And uh, if they do find that, it often is a trigger to maybe even have colon surgery and have that removed. Abdominal radiation, if someone gets radiation for some other uh, cancer, uh, thankfully they've really narrowed the fields of radiation exposure, so I, I haven't seen uh, patients develop uh, colon cancer from a, a remote history of abdominal radiation. Then there's the personal history of precancerous polyps or genetic conditions that, uh, uh, that uh, you may or may not know about, and that's why it's so important to know your family history. So if you have family members that have had colon cancer, and then with Lynch syndrome, if they've had other cancers like uterine cancer, et cetera, it's so important because maybe you're at risk because you may carry that gene. And then you go to the genetics counselor and get genetic testing, and that will just sort of better risk stratify that patient of when to get their, their screening colonoscopy and actually other screening exams to prevent other malignancies. So how can you get screened? So we have visual exams, colonoscopy, and if it's normal, it's recommended every 10 years. Uh, there's CT colonography, which is that virtual CAT scan colonoscopy. You, you don't get out of the bowel preparation, but it takes uh, CT x-ray images of your colon looking for, for polyps. And then there are stool-based exams where, where there are different stool tests that are either looking for blood uh, or they're looking for blood and, and DNA. Now, four of these tests have one thing in common, CT colonography, FIT, FOBT, and DNA testing. If any of those are positive, you get a colonoscopy. That's the recommendation. And so that's why colonoscopy historically uh, has been the preferred test because we could scan, see a polyp, and take it out. Now, we're actually doing some very novel things here at NYU around these types of tests. In the visual side of things, uh, we use special enhancements to flatten the uh, folds of the colon because the colon is not smooth. We're actually using artificial intelligence where when I'm doing a colonoscopy, a computer that was taught on about 30,000 images is another set of eyes identifying areas where polyps could be, so trying to improve our, our detection. 
From the non-invasive side, we're starting an FDA trial where someone swallows a capsule, then when it reaches their colon, it turns on and it uh, puts out a very low dose of radiation, less than a dental x-ray, and it scans the colon. And then we, we look at those images, uh, looking to see if there's any polyps or cancer there. And that one uh, does not require a bowel prep, which is one of the big detractors for some people in terms of getting uh, colonoscopy. So we're really at the forefront of uh, cancer prevention around the colon uh, in gastroenterology. So when should you get screened? Up until last year, the recommendation was average risk individuals should start get screening at the age of 50, and you should go to 75. And then 75 to 85 is sort of all dependent on any other medical problems, if it's safe for that person to, to go through the procedure. Now, the American Cancer Society put out a recommendation last year that was a national news story, which was recommending colon cancer screening starting at the age of 45. The gastroenterology societies are warming up to that idea, and I think we'll have a new position statement around it in the coming year. What's the rationale for this? The rationale for this is that they've noticed a spike in colon cancer in people between the ages of 40 and 50. And so we're starting to see it in younger people. And for that reason, they felt the, the data was compelling enough to increase, to lower rather the age of uh, colon cancer screening to 45. And then of course, uh, high risk individuals, we talked about this family history of colon cancer to consider doing it uh, earlier. And uh, why should you get screened? Because colon polyps and early cancer have no symptoms. This is completely pre preventable, and uh, you could cure this disease. So it could save your life, and if you have uh, friends and family members that have not get any, getting any screening for colon cancer, you know, I would encourage you to talk with them uh, to get them screened. 